All right, guys, welcome to 9.3. We're going to look at interdependencies between species, and we're actually going to break this chapter into two videos. So uh, let's go into the first part. Okay, let's start by defining what is an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is a community of organisms uh, that interact with their surrounding environment at a particular time. Now, there's a few key words in there that is worth noting. Um, ecosystems involve what we call a living component, so the community of organisms that is alive, and uh, we have a non-living component, which is the surrounding environments, and then we have that interaction that is occurring between uh, the living components and each other, and then the living components with the non-living components as well. And all of this takes place at a particular time frame, showing that ecosystems are, you know, kind of identified within that time frame that they are in. Uh, they can vary in size, uh, but they all need to be large enough to permit some sort of interaction. And the study of these interactions is what we call ecology. Okay. So uh, let's look at some scales. Uh, so understanding ecosystems at different scales is really important. So, uh, you know, at an individual level, we're talking about one organisms. At a uh, population level, we're talking about a group of the same organisms in the same area. A community is when you have different populations living in the same area. So you can see there a few different species all living together there. And then um, an ecosystem is when you have that community and you include the environment that they are in and all of that occurring in a time frame. Now you can go beyond that and you can look at what we call a biome, which is when um, you have a large region of, uh, you know, that is defined by similar um, environmental characteristics like the weather and the climate. And then you can also have what we call a biosphere, right? Uh, which is referring to all of the uh, biological activity that occurs on the earth in that zone or that region. Um, now, other terminologies to also get used to, um, the word species is referring to all organisms uh, from the same taxonomic group. And in, in its basic definition, that can interbreed and produce viable offspring. Now, there are a few complicated things like, you know, for example, hybrids and so forth. But generally speaking, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a species. Uh, the habitat is the place um, or or... or officially speaking, the summary of resources, both biotic and abiotic, that an organism lives. And then uh, this particular term, a niche, is referring to the functional role or the specific needs that that organism has in that particular environment, right? Now, there's a bit of a confusing term, right? Uh, but if something is a niche, it's really a specific need or specialization, right? So this is, for example, a habitat, right? So let's say, for example, this tree is a habitat to three species, like the parrot, the honeybee, and the squirrel. So they live in the same habitat, but they don't have the same niche, right? So for example, the parrot specializes uh, or uses the tree as a way for reproducing, right? Having a nest in the tree. Uh, the bee might use or interact, and its niche might be producing food in in the form of like a beehive in the tree, uh, which is separate from the parrot's way of using it. And then the squirrel might use the seeds from the tree um, and then it might eat it and so forth. And so, you know, that's a different niche from the uh, the tree. So the, the interaction that you have there, that those, each of those specific interactions uh, and roles that the organisms play, they're niches, okay? All right, so, um, when we talk about ecosystems, uh, we also need to consider what we mean by the uh, biotic and the abiotic factors. So uh, biotic and abiotic factors are referring to the living and the non-living variables that are going to affect our organism, similar to how we look at biotic and abiotic limiting factors. Um, so when it's limiting, that the factors become, um, you know, limiting factors. Uh, so the things uh, like the water, the rock, sunlight, salinity, oxygen levels are all abiotic factors, whereas living components things include things like predator, prey, disease, competition, etc. Okay. Uh, now this table is here for a task that uh, I want you guys to have a go at doing, but uh, we won't do that for the sake of this video. Okay. Uh, when it comes to ecosystems, biodiversity. Um, is uh, the variety of organisms in the ecosystem. So we, you know, we looked at genetic diversity. Now we're gonna look at biodiversity, right? We measure biodiversity by a few metrics uh, and uh, f you know, a tool of which is the species richness, which is how many different species there are living in that particular ecosystem uh, and species abundance. How many individuals are there in that uh, particular location, right? Uh, so an example is for uh, you know a uh, a place like 
um, a desert will have low species richness, right? But high abundance of those species. So, you know, the spinifex, for example, you might only find one or two species max of plants, but there's going to be a lot of them and they're everywhere, proportionally speaking. Um, whereas, uh, you know, a rainforest will have high species richness, lots and lots of different types of plants, but maybe low relative abundance of each one because, you know, there's not a lot of them around, right? So, in general, in general uh, what you're going to find is when there are favorable environmental conditions, you should end up with a high richness, low abundance because there's a lot of them and uh, they're all competing against each other and no one species is doing really well. However, uh, when you have harsh conditions, you often find there is low richness, but a high abundance. So, you know, there's not a lot of different species that are there, but the ones that are there, they do really well because they figured out how to survive there really well. So that's what you're seeing here, right? The species rank. So you can see that that big drop there. So that that particular location, that's gonna be uh, in a very monocultured environment where there's a lot like a homogeneous environment where there's gonna be like lots and lots of the same thing. And so that's really high proportion. And then as you go, there's a big drop because you know these guys, they're not gonna do so well in survival, but these guys, they're doing really well in survival and particularly this first species, right? And it's capitalizing it. Whereas in a very, very uh, favorable condition, right? Like a pond ecosystem or the rainforest, you should get a bit more of an even spread as a result of that, right? Now, uh, it's probably also uh, worth noting that uh, sometimes species evenness also plays a role. So to, if you can have four of the same species, you know, this patch of grass here could have, you know, one, two, three, four, and they could be there in even proportion or competing really well, or it could actually be quite skewed where there are four species here. So the species richness is exactly the same, but the species evenness is actually not because, you know, there's most of, you know, 70% of them is this particular type of tree, whereas, you know, the other three are just kind of like sprinkled amongst them, right? Um, now, here is the map of the world on terrestrial species richness. And what you're going to notice is that, um, you know, the hot spots, the really parts where there's a really high uh, density of species that's all around the tropical regions right? and that that actually coincides with favorable conditions around the sun and the latitudes and then as you go into the spaces with low richness you're actually looking really at the desert so there's the sahara there's the arabian and there's the you know australian deserts and stuff like that uh, and then your really cold environments as well being very low in species richness here is the aquatic one. Uh, you can see there the same general idea being passed on uh, where you have around the tropics high species richness. Um, and then as you work your way towards the poles, it drops quite dramatically. Uh, and this one you can see a bit better actually. It actually also follows really well the movement of nutrients in large oceanic currents um, across certain coastal areas and so forth as a result of that. So that's really cool there as well. Okay, well, uh, the rest of this particular video is going to be focused on relationships between organisms in the species. And so um, let's take a look at some of those types of relationships. So in ecosystems and habitats, um, they have different relationships and interactions that are occurring with them, right? Uh, interactions can be uh, can also be two way and they're going to affect both organisms. Now, the term relationship and interactions are pretty interchangeable from a from a biological perspective here. Um, but you know, relationship generally speaking is referring to a slightly longer term, whereas interaction could be instantaneous. Um, you can have predator and prey relationships. Um, you can also where one organism is going to kill and eat the other organism. And then you can also have competition where two organisms are going to compete for the same resource. Okay. Um, and then when there are um, uh, what we call symbiotic relationships, that, that is when you have two or more species that live together, or at least in very close proximity with one another, and have a long-term interaction. So, you know, there is a very close connection with them over a long period of time. Um, and there are four types of symbiotic relationships. You've got parasitism, mutualism, commensalism, and amensalism, right? Uh, parasitism uh, is when one organism lives off uh, another one. Uh, mutualism is two of them cooperate. Uh, commensalism is one organism is going to benefit, but the other one's unaffected. And amensalism is when one organism is, you know, uh, detrimental to or affecting badly the other organism, but doesn't get affected by it. All right, let's start with predator and prey because that's the most commonly known relationship, right? So in this relationship, the predator usually kills 
and consumes either all or part of the prey. Predator-prey relationships apply to all organisms, including plants. Uh, even though we don't usually say that the cow is the predator of the grass, uh, it is referring to predation, the process, right? Um, and other kingdoms as well. Uh, this relationship is often represented by food chains and food webs that you might have learned throughout your high school years. And generally speaking, predators will have adaptations that are going to help them capture food and then prey will have adaptations that are going to prevent that from happening. So here's an example, right? This is the territory of the golden eagle. And the golden eagle is the predator of uh, lots of species, including actually uh, deer and so forth. But in this case here, you know, the groundhog. And you can see um, that the golden eagle is going to have uh, specialized adaptations like keen eyesight, long wingspan. It's going to be able to fly around the corner of mountains to hunt down the groundhog. Whereas the groundhog is going to have adaptations like living in communities, being in a burrow, um, having different roles in their groups in order to prevent that uh, from, from, from being eaten, right? Uh, over time, the dynamic relationship between predator and prey should be balanced, right? Where, you know, neither one is going to go extinct because of that process. Otherwise, uh, it will run out and that relationship will then eventually end. Um, this can change if you can get some sort of disturbance. So for example, you know, introduced species can have a big effect on this, but uh, it should be over time quite balanced. Um, and here is an example where uh, you have the, uh, you know, the hair and the lynx, the hair in blue, and then the links in uh, kind of orange. What, and what you should see is actually long term, the predator population, first of all, must always be smaller than prey populations. If the predator population is too high and sustained above that time, they're going to eat all the prey to death and there's no, no prey left, right? As po prey populations rise, you should expect more the population of predators to also rise to match that because there's more prey, makes it easier to catch them and therefore predator population will be on the rise. However, it should be cyclical. So as predator populations rise, it's gonna then stabilize the prey population cycles and it, and it goes all over again, right? So what do I mean by that? Here's an example, right? So the, 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 the hair, the population of the hair might rise up and as it rises, right, um, the, population of the lynx is then going to rise to match that it's a bit of a there's a bit of a lag time between this rise and this rise but you can see it rises and then what happens is as there are more predators they get better at hunting and there's you know eating the hair and that population is going to drop and as it drops there's less food and then you can see the cycle then uh, lags behind the prey population you can see a big spike in uh, 1865 uh, and then it drops down again when the prey uh, predator population rise again. And so, you know, you should get this rise and fall and, and predator population should never be above prey population, but it should kind of go up and lag behind the population. And you can see that repeating over the, de the decades. Um, there, here, oh, whoops, sorry. There, here's, here's, here's a, a generalized graph where you can see that same interaction occurring. Um, okay, when we talk about predators, um, we can class them under two categories. You can have what we call a specialist, predator and a specialist predator is going to feed on mainly one or two types of food and it's going to have adaptations that are going to be really good at uh, eating or capturing that food with greater proficiency however it also means that that predator is going to be reliant on the prey which can be really bad if the prey dies out right so specialists can be like you know cows that eat grass and that's pretty much all they ever eat uh, pandas pretty much only every bamboo. Um, whales, uh, whales. Uh, there's a class or a group of whales called baleen whales and they have modified teeth that form these fibrous filters that are gonna catch and capture krill. And so they are specialists, right? So they only feed on krill um, and some, you know, sometimes they might get a fish in there or something like that, but that, that's their main food source and they're really good and they've got these specialized structures to do so. On the other hand, you can have generalists as well. Generalist um, organisms feed on many different types of uh, prey and, and food. And the advantage is that you've got a wider selection, which means um, when you know a certain species of prey dies out, it's, it's not too bad because you then switch your game and hunt something else. However, the disadvantage is that you're actually not particularly awesome at killing any one type of prey. So when you match up against a specialist for that prey, you're gonna be out-competed. However, uh, you have other options, so that's okay, right? Um, and you know the lion—that's they're a generalist; they'll eat anything that pretty much is is 
uh, is a mammal. Um, and then you got raccoons, you know, raccoons will, you know, they're, they're, they'll eat uh, pretty much anything and they live really well and they actually survive really well in urban areas because of it. And in fact, actually a lot of generalist species, uh, medium to small size generalist species like mice, rats and so forth are actually quite good at adapting to human environments because they are generalists. Um, this is the eagle. This is, a, I believe this is a wedge tail eagle. And then also the killer whale is a generalist as well. Now, um, when we think of generalists and specialists, it's better to think of them as a spectrum as opposed to categories. Um, and on one hand, you have really extreme specialists with a very narrow niche and very specific adaptations. Um, and they're the ones who are actually more likely to go extinct because they've been, they've, they've actually adapted and relied on that particular food source. And then, uh, on the other hand, you have extreme generalists who have a really broad niche. And then organisms can plot themselves anywhere in between, really, um, between this particular spectrum. Okay. Okay. Um, predation. So predation, if when we think of predation, um, to help us understand kind of the adaptation parts of it, uh, you can think of predation as in four stages, right? Um, you can have detection where you got to find it, attack where you have to get to it, you have to capture and kill it and keeping it there with you and then you then have to eat it, right? Anywhere along the lines, uh, predators can have adaptations that allow them to maximize one or more of these stages. And likewise, the prey are then also going to have adaptations to avoid one or more of these uh, stages, okay? Um, so... Uh, as a result of that, over time, you should see that predators then develop those adaptations and they get really good at hunting the prey. But then likewise, the prey are going to then develop adaptations that are going to guard against this. Now, that is called an evolutionary arms race. And that's how some species actually coincide to become more specialized, right? So an example are, include bats, right? So um, bats have really good uh, abilities to listen and echolocate um, you know, using these kind of high pitched sounds, uh, their prey. And so they send a little sound wave out and then they're going to actually listen out for the sound bouncing off things like moths. And then they've developed really big ears, kind of like these kind of, you know, satellite dishes almost to, to be able to listen to the sound and then pinpoint exactly where they are. So bats are pretty much almost blind, but they have really good hearing and can be, can able, uh, you know, and that enable them to detect where the moths are. Now, over time, however, moths have actually also adapted to that and the moths can actually respond to those ultrasounds. So when they listen to that particular sound, sometimes the moth goes into a bit of a spasm and so they kind of flutter in this kind of random motion, which makes the bats really hard to catch them, right? Uh, and then other times the moth can actually, uh, when they get hit with the, the sound wave from the, the, the bat, they can actually release their own disruptive sound wave as well to, so that the bat makes it harder for the bat to actually hear and locate where the moth is, right? And so that, that extreme kind of spiraling of adaptations to, to match and to outcompete and, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to better the other um, party is the evolutionary arms race. Okay, we're looking at competition. So competition is when you have one organism that's going to compete for a resource against another organism. So that resource could be food, it could be space or habitats, it could even be mates, right? So that's uh, sexual competition, right? Um, and competition is often seen to have a negative effect on both organisms. And the reason for that is regardless of the winner, um, both of them kind of, you know, they lose out a little bit because they entered the competition in the first place and were compared to no competition uh, is a disadvantage, right? So uh, a good example, you know, uh, you can have uh, things like, for example, uh, elephant seals. Elephant seals are one of the largest seals in the world and the males have this giant proboscis kind of nose that kind of dangles over much like an elephant's trunk. And, you know, elephant seals, um, they are going to um, compete for the mating rights, right? So one really big adult male, he kind of is in charge of a, the harem of females that are there. And in order to kind of keep them and be able to mate with them, he then has to ward off all the other males they're gonna to wanna to mate with his females. And so the winning male then gets the, uh, the mating rights and passes his genes on to the next generation. Now that type of competition uh, for mates, that's called intra-specific competition, where you have individuals within a species competing for that particular resource. You can also have um, inter-specific competition. Inter means between species, uh, where 
um, you know, different species are going to fight out for that same resource. So a good example is in coral reefs, you often think of this as kind of very vibrant, peaceful, lovely environment, but actually it gets a bit into a bit of a battleground at nighttime because the corals themselves actually compete for space to get better positions of sunlight for photosynthesis, right? Uh, and so actually at nighttime, what you often see is corals will actually compete by eating each other on that particular surface or that particular area. And so two species of corals, this one here and this one here, might fight it out by actually just regurgitating their stomachs and trying to eat the, their opponents throughout the night. And so that is interspecific. Okay, let's have a look at the uh, four symbiotic relationships. Um, and here is a table showing how the effects are on these particular organisms through that particular type of relationship. You can have parasitism, which is beneficial, beneficial to one and harmful to the other. And uh, in the same way, um, parasitism can be interpreted as a form of predation, if you think about it. Um, it's just more long term. Mutualism is beneficial to both. Um, commensalism is beneficial to one, but neutral to the other. And amensalism has no effect on one, neutral to one, but then harmful to the other. And, and organism one and two can be in, quite interchangeable. We don't really, there's no specific reason as to why it's positioned that way. All right, let's start with parasitism. So when you have a parasite, it's gonna live off a host and it's going to have some sort of harmful effect. Now. Parasites can be either be ecto or exoparasites or endoparasites that live on the outside or the inside. So for example, ticks are an ectoparasite. So here's an unfed tick and then there's the same uh, type of tick that's now fully engorged and you can see the bloody thing is like a chock full of blood that it's eaten off an animal, right? Uh, you can have an endoparasite. So for example, uh, worms um, can be parasitic. And so, you know, uh, you can have things like roundworms and so forth that live inside of the body. Um, here is a, a tongue eating uh, lice which eats the tongue of fish and then not only do they eat the tongue of the fish, the fish has no idea because there's, there's no real nerves on the tongue, right? And then the, the lice actually actually then kind of like um, lodges itself into the, the body of the fish and then it actually becomes the, the fish's tongue and it literally then eats and gets a free meal every time the fish is, eats something as well. So that's a pretty pretty messed up thing for a lice to be doing, but it, it does do that. And it just lives there for the rest of its life, which is pretty great. Now, uh, parasites can also be what we call a necrotroph, necro meaning death, um, which means that it's gonna eat the host to death, right? Um, and there can also be a biotroph, which harms but doesn't kill, right? Uh, so a necrotroph could be, for example, a parasitic wasp that is going to lay its eggs in the, uh, you know, in, in its prey. And then eventually that, that larvae is gonna hatch inside the prey and then it's gonna kill the prey and it's gonna eat the prey for nutrition. Um, when you have a necrotroph uh, that then kills it, we often also say that that necrotroph is a parasitoid. It's gonna lay something in there, it's gonna kill that thing and it's gonna eventually um, use that as food, okay? Cool, uh, let's look at mutualism. So mutualism is where two organisms from different species are going to benefit from another, right? Uh, mutualism is really specific to two different species. When they are the same species, we simply just call that cooperation. So, you know, two, two wolves in a pack uh, are, are, is cooperation, but you know, like a wolf and a dog would be mutual, mutualism, right? Um, so examples can include, you know, bees and flowers. That's a very classic example. You know, bees are pollinators and they pollinate flowers. They get nectar and honey, uh, sorry, not nectar and pollen in return for their hives. And so that's a mutualistic relationship. Um, you can have, uh, you know, lichen. Lichen is this, um, kind of like a grayish material that you often see on trees or even park benches. That's actually a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a bacteria, which then forms that kind of, um, that kind of crusty layer on top of the wood. Um, here are coral reefs. So corals themselves are actually made up of two organisms. You've got the coral animal, which is, a, which is an animal. Um, and then you have the zooxanthellae protist uh so it's a it's a, sorry not a protist a protozoan and so that protozoan is actually photosynthetic it can photosynthesize inside the tissues of the coral and it will give the um the nutrients from photosynthesis to the coral and in turn the coral will then provide a home 
for the zooxanthellae uh, and a position in the sunlight for that. So that's a mutualistic relationship, a pretty awesome one, by the way. Um, it's, it makes corals one of the few animals that can actually photosynthesize. Um, most of the time, you know, animals can't do that. Uh, you can have uh, other ones like animal ones. So, so for example, the bullhorn acacia and the pseudomimix ant. So the acacia plant ha actually has adaptations that allow ants to live inside of the trunk and the bark. And what happens is um, the, the, the acacia will then also have the seed pods that the ants can take and then also create these little um, nectaries that secrete nectar um, that the ants can live off as well. In return, the ant provides uh, kind of protection for the plant against other insects. So, you know, the ants will chase off other insects that are gonna try to eat the leaves um, and, and, and ward off the, the, um, the other insects and be the kind of protector in the relationship. Uh, gobies and pistol shrimp. So um, the gobies uh, will sometimes create burrows in the sand and then the pistol shrimp will actually live in there. And what happens is the goby protects the pistol shrimp, but then the pistol shrimp will then clean <laughs> clean the, uh, the burrows so the uh, gobies can survive. So that's a pretty cool little neat relationship there. Um, you also have commensalism and amensalism. amensalism. Commensalism is where one organism is going to really benefit, but it does nothing to the other one. So a lot of uh, good examples is whenever you see a tree growing off another tree, that's often what we call an epiphyte. And so that's an epiphyte plant growing off a tree. And you know, the tree's not going to get anything in return for it, but the epiphyte gets a really good position in the sun, right? Um, barnacles, they often hitch a ride on your whales. So whales will have to often have barnacles on them. And cause you know, whales can't really clean themselves. These barnacles will latch onto them and they, they're getting free feed for, and you know, fresh water coming in and around every time the whale moves, but the whale gets nothing in return. And then you can also have harmful relationships that are neutral as well, where you have um, things like trees overshadowing other trees, right? So when a tree overshadows another tree, you know, that little tree, that's gonna be harmed by the big tree, but the big tree doesn't get affected by the little tree at all. Um, and same with soil toxicity in some plants. Um, walnuts, uh, it's quite commonly known to not, you know, not grow walnuts in your garden alongside other plants because walnuts release, naturally release this toxicity that's going to harm other plants. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's, it's no, of no benefit to the walnut, but it kills the other plants. Okay. All right. That's it for this video. And I'll see you guys in the next video for part two of 9.3.